Welcome to the 2022 UCI School of Education Homecoming Panel. My name is Frances Contreras. I am a professor and dean in the School of Education here at UC Irvine. Today, we're going to be talking about the theme teaching and learning in a changing world. And we're going to engage in a panel discussion, which will address the opportunities for innovation, broadening access, improving educational equity, and promoting parent engagement across K-12 into post-secondary education. School of Education faculty and alumni will share their research and experiences with technology in the classroom, availability of high quality curriculum, and the role of community partnership in driving innovation. We are thrilled to have you here with us today. The UCI School of Education is now entering its 10th year and has already established itself as a preeminent school of education in the nation, ranked number seven among public schools of education and 15 nationally. A main reason for the school's success and preeminence is the innovation and world-class research and deep authentic partnerships with community colleges and K-12 school districts. No other school of education in the country is as adept at both putting research into practice. We are excited to continually utilize genuine authentic relationships to in turn generate more research. And as a result of this dynamic, we're reimagining how a school of education can and should support its students, community, and region. The School of Education is home to more than 10,000 alumni worldwide. Their backgrounds and careers vary, but one commonality among them is the desire to improve educational access, equity, and outcomes for individuals of all backgrounds that contribute to healthy, vibrant, and thriving communities. Between our relationships and the alumni we've educated and cultivated, the School of Education is particularly poised to be at the forefront of the most pressing issues facing education today. Which brings us to today, teaching and learning in a changing world. I am thrilled to be surrounded by an all-star panel of professors, alumni, and staff, all of whom are at the forefront of identifying and addressing the most pressing issues in education. Today, we have Dr. Mark, Mark Borschauer, professor in the UCI School of Education. We have Dr. Keith Curry, president and CEO of Compton College. Dr. Frank Olmos, research and evaluation coordinator with the Los Angeles Office of Education and adjunct professor at CSU Los Angeles, president of the Ant Eaters and Education Alumni Chapter. And we have Dr. Adriana Villavicencio. She is an assistant professor in the UCI School of Education. I will be moderating this esteemed panel. So let's get started. First, I'd like to talk about innovation, and I'm going to start with Dr. Mark Barshauer. Innovation. What are some of the innovative learning models you have developed to support personalized experiences, academic mastery, and positive youth development? Uh, thank you, Dean Contreras. Great question. Uh, one project we're really excited about is the use of artificial intelligence to promote young children's language and literacy development in STEM learning. Uh, in this project, we're programming conversational agents similar to Siri or Alexa to help children learn through dialogue with animated characters. More specifically, we're partnering with PBS Kids and Sesame Workshop to create interactive versions of their TV shows and books in which the characters ask kids questions, wait for their answers, and then respond appropriately using natural language processing. Our experiments with diverse children ages three to six indicate that kids are much more engaged when they can converse with characters and learn a lot more science and vocabulary this way, especially kids who grow up in families speaking languages other than English. With funding from the National Science Foundation, we're now creating interactive versions of PBS Kids shows that will be distributed freely on its platforms, allowing children throughout the country to benefit from this kind of interactive learning. And one of the fantastic things is we have dozens of our undergraduate and graduate students involved in this innovative research. So they themselves are learning innovative cutting edge techniques uh, for, for education and development. Thank you so much, Mark, thank you. Now we're gonna turn to Dr. Olmos. Would you like to tackle that question? What are some of the innovative learning models you have developed to support personalized experiences of students given your context and your background? Sure. Thank you for the question, and thank you for this opportunity as well. Uh, as an alumni, I, what I really enjoyed, first of all, I want to say my experience at UC Irvine was uh, was tremendously 
uh, you know, very beneficial. It was very innovative in the sense of all the different ways of learning and teaching. And um, it's just having, it's just thinking differently and, and trying different strategies to teach and to how students learn. And so the first thing is about self-efficacy, self which is a, a concept that I really used in my dissertation at UC Irvine. And it's about subscribing, having students subscribe to the growth mindset. It's really getting to the psychology of the students and having them to, to believe in themselves and to understand that they can actually accomplish things through effort and through persistence. And so we, 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 I spent a number, uh, at least a number of weeks uh, to just really instill that in my students. The second thing I want to point out is the leveraging of social media platforms. It's about taking the taking the education where the students are, where they spend their time. I established a YouTube channel where I, I created various uh, videos, instructional videos, which, you know, very engaging videos that they enjoy using, at least viewing, and so they can uh, complete their assignments. I also created humorous instructional Instagram postings and also TikTok videos, because a lot of students are spending their time watching TikTok videos. That's where I create these videos. So these are like quick one minute to three minute little concepts and, and uh, you know, uh, instructional uh, content that I can provide to them. And the last thing I want to point out is that I converted a lot of the lectures to recordings. And so, uh, so they could view instead of the traditional model of, of teaching where it's just lecture format, they can view my lecture at any time, but we spend the class time to complete uh, basically their exercises and their assignments, it's essentially work sessions. So I, it gives me a great opportunity to engage with the students, create breakout rooms, use the bulletin board. It really enhances the, the learning and experience of my students. Thank you so much. Um, the next topic is educational equity. Um, we are going to be asking Dr. Villavicencio to start off, start us off with this question. How do we best support educators and administrators in implementing the high quality curriculum in math, science, and English for all students? I know you have a recent book that has just come out on this topic. And so if you could weigh in on this question first um, and get us started, we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Contreras, and thank you for having me here on this panel. Um, I think we can't address a problem unless we name it. So first, we need to openly recognize and acknowledge that schools have not traditionally been designed to serve all students, that the ways we were taught when we attended schools was not necessarily a model of equity, and that we as educators all have room to grow in what it means to implement curriculum and instruction that is academically rigorous, culturally responsive, and linguistically supportive. Second, educators and school leaders need the resources, they need the time and professional development to learn and practice evidence-based and asset-based approaches, particularly in math, science, and English. Our research has documented how this professional development can help teachers unlearn harmful biases, biases that may leave certain marginalized, marginalized groups behind, expand on curricular materials so that they represent the communities they serve, and apply instructional strategies such as thematic project-based learning that we know is engaging for a lot of students while preparing them for college and careers. And finally, this is based on 20 years of being in schools, either as a teacher and now as a researcher, Research uh, teacher practice thrives and teachers thrive when they can meaningfully collaborate and learn from the expertise of their peers. When teachers are provided the time and again, the resources to plan curriculum together and drive their own professional learning, they're more likely to build collective responsibility for the students that they serve. So that it's not just individual teachers who are effective, but rather there's a school-wide effort targeted at student, student, serving students equitably. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now I want to turn to Dr. Curry um, as president and CEO of Compton College. Um, how do we best support educators and administrators in, in the community college system, right, to develop this high quality curriculum in math? We know that that's so critical to transitioning students and in encouraging them to transfer on to the four-year universities. Can you weigh in on this question? Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I, I will start with uh, budgets are your value, budgets are, are your value statements for your organization. And it's very important for me when you look at community colleges and you look at uh, science and English and, and the support for and math for our students, it first starts with providing the funding to support the different initiatives that are being initiated by our faculty members on our, at our colleges. Uh, the first step from my perspective is uh, professional development. Uh, allocating resources to support faculty as well as professional development, but also staff too. 
sometimes we lose sight that it's just about faculty. It's about the whole organization, which includes the staff. So how do you provide high quality professional development for faculty and staff as it relates to math, English, and also science? But then also looking at data from a racial equity lens. Uh, what I've noticed in the CEO, president CEO role over the years is really, is really modeling the data so people know that you have the standards for data and that you're always looking at data from a racial equity lens and trying to drill down in the data to find out what's happening to your students. But then also looking at particularly students who are not receiving those services and just start asking those questions and having that inquiry of why are these students not being successful and what can we do within our organization to support them. So the first step of it is professional is about the budget. Make sure you have budgets. Your budget shows your value statements for your organization. And this is a priority. Second piece is provide that professional development for faculty and also for staff within your organization. And the third piece is really looking at the uh, racial equity uh, and looking at data from racial equity lens. And the, the final piece I would say to this is having conversations with our four-year college university partners, uh, having conversations about our students who are transferred to those organizations and how well those students are doing. Uh, one of the things that I always talk to individuals about is having data sharing agreements, to be able to share data between the four-year college and university with the community colleges. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that you raised the issue of data. I know that um, our other esteemed panelists deal, um, of course, with data in their own um, research, of course. Would anyone else like to weigh in on, on the importance of educational equity and how do we best support educators and administrators? Yeah, I can weigh in if that's okay. Um, so one strategy that we, I think one strategy to establish or at least to help support educators and administrators is to at least create a forum where they can collaborate. It's very similar to what Dr. Adriana was saying. Uh, basically um, having a forum where we have like teachers, administrators, parents, students, nonprofits, community leaders can collaborate to, with each other. And as part of the community schools model, which essentially, essentially is converting the school into a hub of resources uh, for students and parents and their families, and also having and, and instilling a collaborative, uh, at least working culture in the school, uh, we, can, we develop these advisory councils consisting of all these different in stakeholders and individuals. And as a result of this advisory councils from the data that I've seen, uh, we were able to uh, conduct a number of enrichment activities, school activities. These include robotics, uh, let's say programming, coding, uh, a number of different after after school programs. We we essentially leverage the partnerships that we currently have, or we you know we were able to at least gain with the, with the community schools model, and really bring these services to the school, which will enhance learning. Thank you so much, and I think that now more than ever do we need to be paying attention right to this concept and construct of educational equity. Um, and accelerating learning for our students, which brings us to the next next topic of broadening access. How do we increase the number of young people able to access and complete post-secondary programs, completing college, with a focus on removing historical barriers um, for students who are first-generation students? And I'm going to hand that over to Keith um, first, um, Dr. Curry, and then um, move on to uh, some of our other colleagues on the panel. Dr. Curry. I, I start with pre-collegiate programs. I look at my own um, experience and educational background. When I was in high school, I was a part of the early academic outreach program, and that exposed me to the University of California. And I, I truly believe that the informational outreach they provided assisted me to where I'm at today because I was exposed to higher education uh, at, a, at a very young age. So I think pre-collegiate programs are important to continue to fund those pre-collegiate programs uh, to be able to work with the, uh, the, the, student, the, the student demographics that I like to serve who have not been um, able to access higher education. But then also too, I think it's important to have those academic support programs as well for students to help support them academically, not only providing them an informational outreach, but also helping them to help them academically to be prepared for when they do uh, enroll at a post-secondary uh, institution. And the reason why the academic preparation is important because it's not only important that we get them into the college, but we wanna make sure that they graduate. So how do we make sure they graduate is by making sure they're academically prepared for the University of California or a four-year college or university, but providing those types of supports. So first information outreach, pre-collegiate programs are important. Also make sure that we have some academic enrichment programs uh, for these students as well. But then also to providing that professional development for the uh, high school principals, counselors, teachers, uh, and staff about the importance of higher education. Because one of the things that we sometimes forget 
in higher education, especially when you're at a four-year college, at a, a community college, is that we want to make sure we are able to impact the individuals who are connected to the students every single day. And those adults who are around them, if we're able to give them information about college going and higher education, they can be able to have more of an impact to those students. So really looking at what else can we do with those individuals, professional development wise, to, so they can be able to encourage their students about going on to higher education. Thank you, Dr. Curry. Thank you. Um, that was excellent. And I know that many of us on the panel can resonate with the notion of these pre-collegiate programs because we are products of those very programs, right? And early access to mentors. I'd also like to turn over to my colleagues, um, Mark or Adriana, if you'd like to weigh in on this question. Well, I'll just add from the K through 12 perspective, because I am so familiar with um, the, especially high schools, I think schools can do a lot to the somewhat previews the next question, but work with families, work with families to think about higher education opportunities. Sometimes going out of state can seem uh, out of reach for a lot of families and students, but in fact, that might be a really good fit for students. Uh, and thinking about the FAFSA, the FAFSA itself can be a barrier for families who may not know about it, who may not have done it themselves growing up. And so I think um, schools reaching out and communicating some of this um, information to families in a way that's accessible can really also um, lift a lot of barriers for students trying to um, uh, pursue higher education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, engaging parents. And thank you for foreshadowing our next question. But Mark, did you want to weigh in on this, this question? Uh, yeah, I just you know briefly wanted to give an example of, of the kinds of ways we're supporting the students in the community and also helping them when they get here. Uh, we all know, for example, that computer science is one of the uh, central disciplines for, for all STEM subjects and, and a lot of other fields. But too, many, too few students in our diverse communities, especially low-income communities, have the opportunity to study computer science. So uh, we have, for example, a research practice partnership with Santa Ana Unified School District in which we're developing, implementing, and evaluating a computer science curriculum that is very tied to the needs of the kind of low-income immigrant students who predominate in Santa Ana and so many of our school districts. And this helps them develop computer science knowledge, but also more stronger computer science identity and STEM identity and language and literacy proficiency, and really develop the skills so that they can apply and thrive in college. And then when they get to college, especially if they're uh, students in our School of Education, we give them opportunities to be involved in research projects such as this one, where they can go back to the communities and support uh, research to improve the educational outcomes of, of kids from uh, their own communities. So we're, we're really uh, hitting it on, on all angles. And I think this kind of holistic approach that Keith talked about, that Adriana talked about, that's central to the School of Education is really critical for addressing this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for adding to that. Um adding to our wonderful um, panelists' responses um, in that area of broadening access. We're gonna now move to the final topic, which is parent engagement, um, which is another critical topic that we as a school of education are passionate about. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a survey that went out from a community organization called BICA, the Parent Institute for Quality Education. And they found that over a third of Latinx Spanish speaking families, for example, that they surveyed out of 1100 parents, that these parents didn't have access to an email. And so it really speaks to this issue of access, right? Access to technology, <clears throat> access to schools, because if you don't have access to an email, which is one of their key findings, you're out of the communication loop in many times with schools. And so um, parent engagement is an area that is essential um, as we work with schools. So I'm gonna move on to this final question. And that is, what are the additional ways that parents are being engaged as active partners in student learning with some of the work coming out of the School of Education, but also with our esteemed alumni here? So we'll start with Adriana on that question. Yeah, such an important area to discuss when it comes to educational success and equity. And I want to start responding by saying that, you know, my parents were immigrants. I was raised by a single mother. Uh, she was incredibly driven, intelligent, savvy. She was able to start her own business. 
Um, but she wasn't raised here and she didn't understand how our schools operated or what it meant to apply for college, as I was saying in the previous response. She also worked six days a week from early morning to about 7 p.m. at night. So she wasn't one of these parents who could serve on the PTA and she wasn't super involved in my studies or my homework. Um, so I think uh, schools first need to understand the situations our families are in and meet parents where they are. Um, that could mean offering alternative days or times or platforms to attend school events or providing different modes of communicating with teachers. In fact, um, surveys that we've distributed to teachers over the pandemic, we've heard a lot um, that they've appreciated the opportunity to engage with families remotely and over Zoom. Um, and, and these are ways of communicating that they hadn't really employed before. Uh, so hopefully that can stick around past the pandemic. Um, and schools need to also provide, as, as you referred to, um, provide translation services. So they are reaching as many families as possible. And as they do with students, they need to engage or should with students, they need to engage families from an asset-based perspective and not assume that because their participation doesn't look like the traditional patterns of parent engagement, that it's because they don't care or that they don't know any better. Um, my colleagues and I recently wrote a paper about what this looked like in an immigrant serving school in particular, that not only provided multiple services to families around immigration and translation and knowing your right services, but also leveraged families' funds of knowledge or their cultural histories and experience to better serve their students. And I, I think that's the kind of robust partnerships between schools and families we wanna see throughout the K through 12 system. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for raising these critical points. Let's move on to the rest of our panelists on this question, um, if I may. So I'm gonna turn over now to Frank, if that's okay. So just to add what Dr. Adriana was saying, it's really uh, understanding the needs of the parents. And the, the, the excellent thing about my job is as the research and evaluation coordinator for community schools initiative, I get to see all of our site data and all of the things that we're doing to trying to engage parents. Uh, first of all, it's a huge challenge, especially at the high school level. Uh, elementary is a little bit easier because they tend to be a little bit more involved, but it tends, it tends to you know, taper down uh, in terms of engagement down junior high all the way to high school. And so we get to see all the different strategies and one thing, uh, you know, definitely technology is, has served as a barrier. So we always try to find ways to find them equipment of technology. It could be a laptop. It could be also not only, you know, how, you know, also cell phones, but not only that, but also how to use technology because we have to train them how to even launch Zoom, how to, you know, make sure the microphone's working, et cetera. You know, things like that. We have to, you know, in, in at least give them the proper training. And other things that I've seen that we're doing with our sites is like we're having coffee with the principal, which is like a week weekly event that, to further engage the parents, you know, it's just like, let's have coffee with the principal, let's chat about what, what questions you may have about the school, what activities. Uh, another point I do want to point, uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, at least say is that in one, uh, one of our slides, we actually established a store. We got so many donations from different organizations that it, we established a store. And, you know, of course, all, this, all the items are free to distribute, but that became a gateway, you know, a gateway. So pe people got word of it. And then not only students, but parents, family, community members were able to come in, at, you know, anytime uh, to actually gather um, clothing items from the store. And, 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 be, and served as a good way, look, oh, by the way, uh, if you're a parent, look, this is something we're having at this uh, next week. Uh, this is something you can get involved or this is something you can get more engaged with the teacher. So it becomes really a, a way for them to further get engaged. So uh, that, you know, we, can, we have to really be creative and find different ways depending on the needs of the community and the parents and also the time that they're available. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to turn over to Keith. Um, what are some ways that, parents are being engaged at the community college level? You know, I, I, this is, I'm disappointed in this, uh, my response that I'm about to give regards to this, because I think we can be doing more as it relates to engaging our parents. And so one of the things that we try to do at our organization is engage parents through orientation, when we do orientation for students, including the parent in the orientation, but we don't do enough follow-up with the parents after their student, are, their child is enrolled at our organization. And so that's what I'm disappointed about. How can we do more for the parents, for the students' parents while the students enroll on our campus. Because when you look at uh, community college and enrollment and higher education, is that these parents can end up being our students as well. And so thinking through, and I think through this question and trying to figure out what can we do more, we, we should be doing more. 
right? And we should be doing more with our K-12 partners as relates to parents, but also with our students' parents while they're on our campus. How can we re-engage them into the conversation regards to their own higher education, but also to understand how we operate so they can know how their child would transfer. They would know how their child and why financial aid is the FAFSA is important. How do we engage them? So one is there's things that we are doing regards to engaging students and their parents at the beginning of their registration process. But I'm also thinking I'm disappointed we should be doing more throughout the educational experience for the parents so they can be able to understand, but also we can be able to engage them in higher education and they might end up coming back and being a student. Great. Thank you so much. I think we can all agree that we can and should all be doing more to engage our parents as partners. I'm going to turn it last to Mark, uh, Professor Warshauer, if you'd like to wrap up this question on parent engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Contreras. This is a fantastic question. I really enjoyed hearing everybody's responses. And, and I want to bring it back to the research we do, because we're approaching this from, from multiple angles, and, and the research is an important uh, aspect. Uh, so uh, as Adriana mentioned, a lot of uh, our parents in our community, they wanna get involved. They support children's education, but they often fa face uh, apps, obstacles, uh, their own communities, resources aren't drawn on, et cetera. So we're trying to find the ways through our research to help parents be involved in the most productive way possible. Uh, I was talking before about the way we're developing conversational agents to promote interactive dialogic learning with children. Well, well, what about the parents? They should be involved in that too. So as a, as a next stage of this research, we're programming the artificial intelligence to spark three-way interaction between children, parents, and agents. Uh, so we're partnering with Sesame Workshop right now on designing bilingual eBooks uh, as I said about before, the characters will first pop up and ask the kids questions about what they're reading in dialogue with them a little bit. And then the character will pop up and say, so now in your family, we talked about this, you know, what kind of foods do you eat in your family? Or how do you address this issue in your family? And to encourage uh, communication starters. We're also uh, programming these conversational agents so that they can uh, understand and respond to uh, sentences in English, sentences in Spanish. And for one of the first times in a real technological innovation, sentences that include code switching of English and Spanish, as is so frequent in our communities and, and respond appropriately. And then we're doing, we're co-designing these, these eBooks together through workshops with families in Santa Ana so we can see you know, what characters they appreciate, uh, what cultural resources they wanna draw on and talk about, et cetera. Uh, and also developing these so that they can work uh, not only on you know, expensive computers, uh, but on uh, cell phones, tablets, Chromebooks, eventually on TVs as they're developed a little bit more so that all families can use these on their own devices. So I think this is a great example of we're approaching these things through our teaching, our service, and our research uh, through our work. Once students already reach the college level and their families and parents, but really from a very young age to promote uh, parent engagement in the learning process. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for highlighting this critical research and how you're engaging communities and parents in that process. And I think we can all agree that um, each and every one of you um, are really impacting your communities within your spheres of influence. So I just wanna thank you for being agents of change in that process, because we need more of you that are engaged with our communities and in our schools at every level um, to really impact educational equity. So thank you for the work that you do every day. Which brings us to the closing. Um, I know we can sit here and talk all day about these issues um, and then walk away inspired, but I hope that you as the audience also continue to be inspired and that you're walking away inspired and committed to supporting and improving educational equity throughout Southern California and the state. We also invite you to stay connected through the School of Education, through our website, our news portals, um, and our many events that we have and hold uh, throughout the academic year. And we also invite you to join Ant Eaters in Education. We have an alumni chapter and we happen to have the president on this call, Frank Olmos. 
Um, and so your membership will is open and it's not only to the School of Education alumni, but also any UCI alumni chapter. We really encourage you to get engaged, to be part of the UCI Anteater fam Familia in practice and encourage you to attend our multitude of events. So thank you again for joining us here today for this esteemed panel discussing educational excellence and teaching in a changing world. Thank you.